Aaron's Hearts Museum is one of Huntsville's proudest landmarks. With humble beginnings starting out as just a section in an antique shop, it then grew and became a traveling education tour for local schools. From there, the donations and volunteers kept on coming, so they had to expand. Moving to a larger lease space in Huntsville's West Hills Mall, the Hearts Museum started making a name for itself around town until it finally grew out of its own walls. With the help of local veterans and volunteers, the museum received a grant to start construction on a new permanent site in 2009. The Hearts Museum's new location is now home to a multitude of displays, including a Huey helicopter, Cobra attack chopper, an F-16 fighter jet, and an M-60A3 Patton tank. Inside the museum are tributes and stories to all the armed forces, including the Marines, the Coast Guard, Air Force, Army, and the Navy. Also, there are historical sections that tell not only our nation's history, but add a more personal touch with areas dedicated to local heroes of wars, both past and present. So come out to the local Hearts Memorial Museum and visit with local veterans. They are located out on 463 Highway 75 North here in Huntsville, Texas, and are open Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. For more information, call 936-295-5959. The Veterans Hearts Museum, where we are helping every American remember through serving. I'm Richie Harris, and I'm the director of Hearts Veterans Museum. If you don't know where that is, it's up on North 75 Highway in Huntsville. And today we're having a garage sale and that's what all the commotion is about. Uh, we have a garage sale every year. It lasts two days. Uh, we set up for it three or four days in advance, like a super garage sale. And we do this for the purpose of supporting the museum. Uh, generally it pays the expenses for about two months. Uh, and that's what we're hoping to do this year. And by the crowd that we have in uh, it looks like we'll probably be right on target. So it, it serves a very useful purpose. My name is George Gresham. I'm a retired sergeant first class in the United States Army. My first two years of service was in the Navy. I was a Navy corpsman. I served most of my time with the Marines in the 1st Marine Division in North China. That was 1946 and 47. Got out of the, got out of the Navy in 46. 48, I joined the Army. I was in the Army 19 years. I sp my first assignment was Fort Sam Houston, Brook Army Medical Center. From there, I went to Heidelberg, Germany for three years. Spent three years there and went, came back to Fort Sam Houston. I went to Shape Headquarters in Paris, France. Spent three and a half years there. Oh, by the way, when I was in Heidelberg, I met a, a a WAC, that's the Women's Army Corps, a person in the Women's Army Corps. And later we were married, and we've been married a little better than 60 years now. But anyway, she went to France with me. We had two daughters that were born in Paris, France. We came back to the States, Fort Sam Houston again. That's where all the medics go. Well, I got seasick for one thing, so I was, the Navy was, wasn't too good in the Navy. And I, with the Marines, I was a corpsman, a first aid man, with a company aid man, and, a and I worked in a hospital, and uh, of course in the Army. I, when I got out of the Army, we came to Huntsville. We came to Huntsville in 1967. My name's Dan Leonard. I served both in the Army and in the Air Force. I'm retired from the Air Force get back to the Army, and I joined it in February the 7th of 1946, and went over to Germany and was in the Army of Occupation over, over there, which they divided after the war was over, they divided the Germany into three zones, a Russian zone, an American zone, and a British zone, and I was in, in the uh, American zone. And I'd been there about three weeks, and had an opportunity, I was in Bamberg, Germany, which was constabulary headquarters, which was the occupational force of, of, of Germany. And uh, first, the chief clerk came down the hall and said he had two tickets to the Nuremberg war trials, which Nuremberg was only about 30 miles away. So I got to go to one session of, of that, which was awesome to, 
see the criminals in, in their criminal box and the tribunal was up above and Chief Justice Black of the Supreme Court was head of the tribunal. And this is what they, uh, General Eisenhower had set up. Now in the Pacific, uh, uh, General MacArthur set up a whole different type of thing. They tried an awful lot more people, but Eisenhower just tried 21 people. And they uh, released three of them, dismissed the charges, and convicted 18 of them, 12 of them to be hung for being war criminals. And, and one of them, uh, probably the most notable man on there, was Herman Goring, which is the head of the Luftwaffe. When, when I went to the trial, he was in the, jur I mean, in the prisoner box right or directly, probably 30 feet from from where I was sitting. It, 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 a small country boy from northwest Florida. This was a little bit, uh, well, I, uh, awe-inspiring to sit, know that you're seeing these people. The Nuremberg Trials were a series of military tribunals held by the Allied forces of World War II, most notable for the prosecution of prominent members of the political, military, and economic leadership of Nazi Germany. The trials were held in the city of Nuremberg. The first and best known of these trials described as the greatest trial in history by Norman Burkett. One of the British judges who presided over it was the trial of the major war criminals before the International Military Tribunal, or the IMT. Held between November 20, 1945 and October 1, 1946, the tribunal was given the task of trying 23 of the most important political and military leaders of the Nazi regime. Not included were Adolf Hitler, Heinrich Himmler, and Joseph Goebbels, all of whom had committed suicide several months before the indictment was signed. The second set of trials of lesser war criminals was conducted under the Control Council Law No. 10 at the U.S. Nuremberg Military Tribunals. Among them included the doctor's trial and the judge's trial. In the doctor's trial, 20 of the 23 defendants were medical doctors and were accused of having been involved in Nazi human experimentation and mass murder under the guise of euthanasia. Joseph Mengele, also known as the Angel of Death, was one of the leading Nazi doctors in charge of the internment camp Auschwitz and evaded capture and was never found. My name is Isis Martin, and I'm the office manager at the Hearts Veterans Museum. Currently, we're in the middle of our biggest fundraiser. It's the garage sale. It's the annual fundraiser for the museum. The museum is a nonprofit organization, so we rely on donations. The money that we raise from this will probably support the museum for about two months. All of the volunteers that you see in here, there's probably over 60 volunteers here today and um, they're all veterans or families of veterans. The Hearts Museum's Fundraising Garage Sale is an annual event. This year, it took place on Friday, September 20th, and Saturday, September 21st, and lasted all day. This is the largest fundraising event the museum holds, and along with donations and volunteers working tireless hours, it helps keep the museum running for several months. Everything is donated, and we appreciate it. the community has just been doing great. Which we are still getting donations even now. You're out here, um, Christmas, holiday. I'm outside. Um, things going on. Just 
please come and help support the Veterans Museum because it's the only way that we can keep the museum running and it's such an important thing. These are your local veterans that this is really are running it and they're the ones that um, are in charge of this. I grew up in Huntsville, but I'm back here supporting the veterans. My name is Betty Nelson. And what all do you have in your section? I'm, I mostly handle the boutique section, which is maybe something that's more than 25 cents. <laughs> so we have some very beautiful things here, and all the people donate so greatly, and we actually really need their support because probably whatever we take in here will help us for about three months with our lights and water gas, all, all our utilities, so we really need everyone to come in and shop. Okay. My name is Ronald Holliday. Okay. And what, what were you in the military? What I branch? was in the Marine Corps. Okay. I was in 1953 to 56, right at the end of the Korean War. I was not in the Korean War itself. I was one of the fortunate few that got messed up in, in uh, California, and I ended up in Hawaii. That yeah, was tough. <laughs> um, but what did you do in the oh, I was a supply sergeant. And what did they do? We distribute all the goods that the people in the group needed. Have to go and requisition stuff and bring it in and make sure it was there when they got ready to leave. We were on twenty four hour notice to leave out, so we had to be ready to go. I was in a radar unit. The Korean War was a war between the Republic of Korea, now known as South Korea, supported by the United Nations, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, now known as North Korea, at one time supported by the People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union. It was primarily the result of a political division of Korea by an agreement of the victorious allies at the conclusion of the Pacific War at the end of World War II. The Korean Peninsula was ruled by the Empire of Japan from 1910 until the end of World War II. Following the surrender of the Empire of Japan in September 1945, American administrators divided the peninsula along the 38th parallel, with U.S. military forces occupying southern half and Soviet military forces occupying the northern half. The failure to hold free elections throughout the Korean peninsula in 1948 deepened the division between the two sides. The North established a communist government, while the South established a right-wing government. The 38th parallel increasingly became a political border between the two Korean states. The situation escalated into open warfare when North Korean forces invaded South Korea on the 25th of June in 1950. The U.S. provided 88% of the 341,000 international soldiers which aided South Korean forces with 20 other countries of the United Nations offering assistance. Suffering severe casualties within the first two months, the fighting ended on July 27, 1953 when the Armistice Agreement was signed. The agreement restored the border between the Koreas near the 38th parallel and created the Korean Demilitarized Zone, or the DMZ, a 2.5 mile wide fortified buffer zone between the two Korean nations. Minor incidents still continue today. In the United States, the war was initially described by President Harry S. Truman as a police action, as it was an undeclared military action conducted of the United Nations. It has been referred to in the Anglosphere as the Forgotten War, or the Unknown War, because of the lack of public attention it received both during and after the war, and in relation to the global scale of World War II, which preceded it, and the subsequent angst of the Vietnam War, which succeeded it. Here, this is, this is Veteran Alley, by the way. You'll meet a lot of veterans and board members through here. Another board member and another, another veteran. How are you today? Good. Doing all right? Good. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. Norman. Yep. Let's see. Norman Ward. Norman Ward is another board member also. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. These guys are from Sam Houston, yeah. and they're here doing a segment for Channel 7. Okay. So, Norman is responsible for all those golf clubs behind you. <laughs> not really, not really. He managed to get Raymond's Nest to give up some of those. Was it you? Tom Davis. Tommy was. I don't know why I was. Oh, you were the carpet. Yeah. Tommy, 
Davis was the one that's responsible for getting all these golf clubs to, donated to us for our sale. Well, not all of them. And then, well, the majority of them. And then um, the carpet back here is Norman Ward. From Ward Sir, yes. here's my sidekick. If I come to work with no coffee or breakfast, I can count on Teresa to take care of that for sure. And then she guides me all day long. Right. Yes. yes. She's my brain. She, she's my brain. This is Mark. Let's not forget Mark. Mark is like me. He likes money. Especially today. Okay, so we're going to go in the museum. Usually when people um, pay their admissions, then we have them sign in here so we can track how many people are coming through on a daily basis. We always leave a donation box out here so that, you know, they can drop money if they want to. Sometimes, like Labor Day, Memorial Day, there's not a fee for admission, so this little box, you know, they, they want to give us something, so that's what that's for. About six or seven years ago, uh, a guy came in here to the museum. His name is Justin Howell, and uh, he lives in Katy. He wanted to know if we would be interested in some of his carvings. And as you know, everything in this museum is donated. These carvings are some of five feet long, six feet long, big logs that he has carved and done a magnificent job. Uh, half of them relate to the war in Europe when we fought Germany in World War II, and half of them relate to World War II in the Pacific. Uh, so the scenes on it relate to two different places, but World War II. Uh, some of the scenes are just fantastic. They have uh, scenes uh, of bombers, bombers in there with fighter planes in the center of it that he has carved in the wood. Uh, we have a scene with a couple of guys in a foxhole and another guy in another foxhole and they're talking back and forth to each other. It's becoming nighttime and the mist is going over them, the mist in the clouds and in the clouds all the faces of their buddies that got killed in action they're talking about. So they're talking about all of these guys that are in there. Uh, we have another scene uh, in one of the islands off the Pacific and uh, it, these Americans are walking right into the Japanese, right into them. Uh, so they're, they're really fantastic to see. Uh, I would say it took him about a year to carve each one. So it's a, it's a, a real project. Uh, I was in uh, Air Force, 1955 to 1975. And what was your name, sorry? Uh, first name James, last name Gribble. Okay. And uh, I was in the, it's been numerous names, but it was military police, security police, Air Police. <laughs> they named it over different names over the years. I think they're now back to Security Forces, I believe, is what they call it now. Uh, like I say, I've been retired since 1975, so a lot of things have changed. Uh, I lucked out. I didn't end. I didn't go to Vietnam, but I was in Thailand, and uh, I was one of the flying cops, flew reconnaissance around the base on helicopters. The base I was on didn't exist, so that's as far as I can go there. <laughs> I got a top secret clearance early in the career, so I was assigned to a lot of different things that I can't talk about. But they would be interesting though, huh? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly would be. Uh, I ended up in Omaha, Nebraska with uh, SAC Elite Guard. The SAC headquarters, the old SAC headquarters, it no longer exists. The building's still there. But we were uh, security for the building plus a ceremonial outfit. So uh, escorted people to the underground, the old command post, classified tours, classified and unclassified.
I think they've done away with them, but they used to have what they call morale tours. And John Q. Citizen would sign up, and we had them, I think, every night. We'd take roughly 25 people down to the command post, and they'd get a unclassified briefing <laughs> down there. Uh, other than that, uh, it was a pretty uneventful 20 years. Yeah, 20 years and 22 days, but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs>
and each tree represents some one of the soldiers that was lost from here, from Walker County. And it has the, their name and rank. Every one of the trees is, is that way. There's a lot still to go to, that's supposed to occur here. Thank you. 